My name is Anthony Kazazis, and I am the director of the NYC Network Group, as well as the NYC Real Estate Expo. And uh, before we actually get started, I just wanted to make a really quick announcement. A lot of people have been inquiring about the Expo. Um, we definitely are scheduled for the fall of November 2nd. However, if COVID-19 is still active, we do have an alternative date for June 23rd, 21. And I also wanted to thank you all for coming on board and, and registering for Louise and Vince Rocco's NYC market, should I stay or should I go? And um, so we have here Louise Forbes. Louise Forbes is a 30 year veteran as an industry leader in New York City residential real estate with a career sales exceeding over 4 billion. She is considered one of the elite power brokers in Manhattan. She's a proud mother of two beautiful teenage boys and married to a serial tech and entrepreneur, Chris Forbes. Vince Rocco is the senior real estate advisor at Halstead Real Estate for the past 18 years. He specializes in new condo development, sales and resales throughout New York City and has sold for more than 800,000 throughout his years. He is also a talk show host of a very popular online radio podcast. Good morning, real estate each Tuesday live at 9 a.m. Let's get started. We want to talk about, you know, should I stay or should I go? What does that really mean? Well, you know, in our industry in real estate in New York City, there's been a lot of buzz lately about people wanting to leave New York City. Uh, this is cer certainly nothing new. We've heard this right after 9-11. We've heard this right after the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. It seems like every time there is some level of crisis, whether it's serious or minor, <clears throat> people tend to want to leave, head to the suburbs, buy a house, have more outdoor space, and especially with the pandemic that we um, are hopefully coming through and towards the end of, I think outdoor space and fresh air mean a lot more to people than ever before. But we'll, we'll get into a little bit about that uh, as we go through. But I just wanted to, a personal comment, you know, on my end, uh, just to start with, I think we hear this all the time. And I think, you know, what we're going to end up seeing as we talk through this today, that people who may have already planned an exodus, to use that word that everybody is using, uh, that was already planned. And so maybe this was the impetus for them to, you know, kickstart a new life or a new home. But on the flip side of that, you know, there's always the, the people who say that um, they're going to go and they're going to go permanently and never come back. So before we get into that, I just wanted to give you some really positive stats that uh, I was looking at the other day. There's been a 21% jump in new homes, brand new homes, that is, people building homes, not buying older homes. This is nationwide, and that's a 21% jump from May of 2019 to May of this year, 2020. So in that one year, through all of this last three months has been a 21% jump. Applications, not mortgages, applications for new purchases is up in the last seven weeks. That's a 17% increase year over year, May of 19 to May of 20. We all have heard the good news about unemployment. That rate is now 13.3%, down from 14.7% during the height of the pandemic. And that added 2.5 million new jobs since the country uh, went into lockdown. So hopefully this week when the new numbers come out, that's even better. Many New Yorkers are deciding to flee the city, as I said at the open, uh, opting for suburban areas with more space for their families in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. And these are mostly from what I'm hearing, at least in my business, these are families with children, who want to provide a safer environment and again, more air, more openness, more outside. So with, uh, with that said, Louise Phillips Forbes, Wheezy as we call her, our beloved friend also at Halstead is with us today. She's got so much more to say than I do. So. <laughs> Wheezy, welcome. Thanks, thanks. So yeah, listen, what have we been doing for the last 90 days? Should I stay or should I go? 
And this is really what my experience has been with my clientele. I have done 46 analysis for individuals that I sold homes to, multiple homes, um, you know, and, and I've sold their children and even their grandparents and their parents' homes. Some of, are, they're all trying to decide what's right for me. And what's right for you, Vince, may not be right for somebody else. And really looking at a close look, internal, quieting the noise. Because if you try to time a market, we know that that is, I think, muffles the, the process. The priority should be what's right for your family, what's right for your life, what's right for what's the safest thing. Whatever is driving somebody and make somebody tick. Statistically, when you're talking about the 17% in applications, I will give you a phenomenal fact about Wells, only Wells. Darren Fink um, in the New York office shared with me for the month of March, and we all know pre-COVID, we were having one of the strongest traction that we've experienced since 2016. And they did 600% increase in refinances, number one, but the applications, which a normal strong month would be 900 applications, just this office, they did 1,700. And that equaled not 1.9 billion of of pre-approved money, but $3.5 billion of pre-approved. That tells me that people are poising themselves to be nimble and flexible. And that's good news for us. Louise, when you when you're talking to your your clients, you know, uh, as we've all been have, have been working remotely, and some of them are indicating a potential move uh, out of the city, whether they're going from a rental to a house in the burbs or a sale here in New York City to a house in the burbs, do you have any sense of where they are going? For example, I've been talking this week alone to two two of my um, uh, sales clients who I've sold, you know, again many many apartments to. And they have asked this week uh, alone for me to list when we can in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. And they're looking to move to Westchester, out of the city up to Westchester, both uh, with children. Are you getting a sense of where people want to leave, leave to in your book of business? Well, yeah. I mean, listen, you know, I, I have some interesting facts that I thought was interesting to me. Uh, and I talked to Will Zeckendorf. I talked to our economist. I, you know... Not everybody knows I'm not a ferocious reader, but I love data. And, um, you know, cause and effects, um, we've, there have been 5% of residents of, of Manhattan, 420,000 people from March 1st to May 1st have evacuated the city. Now, if we really deal, that's a pretty powerful comment five percent of manhattan's population but you got to remember i'm one of those people i am a diehard i am betting on new york for the rest of my life in fact my loving husband will know that if he wanted to raise the kids in westchester i told him he should marry another girl (laughs) um and i'm going to be in the city but i have a second home but um you got to remember that's going to be a certain echelon of individuals and i personally believe that people that are choosing to leave is going just like September 11th, just like Hurricane Sandy, just like the financial, you know, uh, the Great Recession, that exodus um, is not going to be as mass. People are doing, what's happening now is normal, normal human behavior. And that is to take a pause and figure out what's right for yourself. Well, as I said before, I think a lot of people may have had this thought in mind. Listen, you know, New York City is a, is a wonderful place to live, but it's not always for everyone. And oftentimes when people start out in the city, you know, from wherever they come from around the world, uh, they settle in as a single person, they get a job, uh, they start getting uh, more success, finding more success, making more money, they meet the, the love partner of their, of their life. And a funny thing happens. They either stay in the city after they get married or they move out of the city and they make a, an educated decision on where do I want to raise my kids. So I think a lot of that has always been what has happened. Uh, but I remember reading something about a week or two ago where the post office was saying, and y- your statistics were right, so many people were forwarding mail over the past three months out of New York 
more than ever before for obvious reasons. Lots of people, including myself, are not in the city and haven't been in almost three months. Uh, we'll return when the time is right for us to get back to work. So people are doing it anyway. They're in their country homes. They're in their weekend homes. Yep. But, but I want to just... Next week or two or three. And I wanted to also talk about Deborah. I just had Deborah uh, Camacho just get, make a comment about temporary and seasonal re rentals. I'm going to give you some facts that are interesting about Fairfax, just Fairfield, excuse me, uh, Connecticut. Um, and, and uh, you know, that's comprised of about 22 towns and, and they, they usually track very closely. Our office specifically, thanks to Brian Clary, um, he tracks very closely the 12 towns closest to New York City. Um, you know, the first quarter, uh, that's, uh, they, were re they were experiencing 25% surge. So let's look at the number of sales in the first four and a half months of 2020. Of those 12 counties, there were 1,616 transactions compared to 1,500 um, previously. But the rental market is 50% stronger. So that makes total sense to me. You, we missed our spring break. My kids were like, you know, supposed to be in Mexico surfing with me. And we were in a, our beach shack in Montauk, you know, and so people did rentals, 453 rentals compared to 220. And the percentages of houses and accepted offers, so May 2020, those 12 towns had 790 accepted offers compared to 500 the previous year. That's a 39% growth. That's, that's a great cause and effect, and that's great for their economy. So. There's no shoe falling off, you know, of, of that. That's a behavioral, natural phenomenon. And that is a great cause and effect for those places. Westchester is going to benefit from this. Uh, by the way, guys, uh, if you want to ask questions, please put them in the chat room. Louise and I will get to them as quickly as we can. But Louise, before I get to the first question here from Eric, um, you know, there's also been talk about people not only leaving the city to go to the suburbs, but they're going to places like Austin, Texas, Miami, Florida, Los Angeles, points in the Midwest. What do you think is driving that decision? I think that that has been a phenomenon that has been happening for a decade. Um, I mean, you know, look at Portland and look at the growth that they've experienced. Austin, Texas, and the diversification of um, their tech and their food and their television um, you know, they still have infrastructure issues, but cost of living and, and that is one of the whole amazing gifts of what the millennial generation has given us is the habits and how they work. Two thirds of that entire generation are entrepreneurial, yeah. which is phenomenal. And yeah. this, by the way, this silver lining of the coronavirus is we are all going to adapt. I'm the most non-tech chick there is but we are all gonna adapt and doing business differently. That is how New York, that's why I am betting, I will always bet on New York City because we have beat the odds since the 70s when the city was almost bankrupt, when the 1980s and all the companies that, that fled New York, we are not solely a Wall Street city. We are so diverse with, look at our healthcare, look at the three massive expansion of universities that are happening. Yeah, we're tough. And I remember after 9-11, uh, I happened to, well, I was living in the city, of course, but I happened to be right in the, in the middle of all that 9-11 stuff. And I remember telling people days after that when they said, are you running out of the city? Are you moving out of the city? Are you going to the country? I said, absolutely not. I said, I am a New Yorker. And if they want to come and get me, they're going to get me in New York City. We're fighters and we're, we're, we're stormtroopers and we're feet on the street. I, anyway, so, uh, can, uh, can I can I just I want to come remind me I want to talk to you about sales annual sales after September 11th after Bear Stearns and yeah. after Hurricane Sandy and tax laws change. But go ahead, let's get to some of these questions. Hi, hi, Clayton. So Eric uh, Zollinger says, curious to know what your thoughts are regarding taxes and future of sales price, given the impact uh, from. 
2019 transfer and mansion tax change, Chicago announced actually yesterday, $700 million budget gap since uh, the pandemic began mid-March. Property taxes will be one of the first places that they are going to raise. I agree with you, Eric, in New York City, that's gonna be a major problem, but Louise, your thoughts? Well, you know, listen, uh, I believe personally um, that we're gonna lose more people to the SALT tax than we are going to for the pandemic. Um, you know, when you look at the, in, in, you know, when you have a perfect storm and you have a political arena that wants the, the you know, wealthy to pay for everything, um, you are going to, you're, you're gonna drive a wedge. Um, we had that happening, you know, with, with, uh, with the president. We have that happening in a lot of critical political arenas. Um, I just think that it will be interesting. And I do believe, Eric, to answer your question, look, I think we have a long road. Um, but what I do know is that we only have 38% of New York City available to even be bought. It is a city of renters. That's a fact. So there's wealth preservation there. Secondly, you have, we have had a decline in our market. We grew from 2009 to 2015. It's such an unsustainable record, incredible recovery um, that it wasn't sustainable. So we've had a natural plateau of 2016 during the political arena of, of, of the election and 17, 18 and 19 were declining. But it's interesting to look at the volume of sales and the average price per sale. I think we have, I, I'm telling people that I'm working with right now that if you are up strong and have a great um, asset that your money can work somewhere else, then it, it's a good decision to diversify instead of waiting for the peak, which was 2015 or 17, depending on what sector you're in. Couldn't agree with you more. Question from Clayton uh, Steele says, for those of us who are committed to New York City, but want to change apartments, sell and buy or rent, what is the outlook for sales by neighborhood and the timeline and path to getting our properties on the market strategically. So coming out of the pandemic, I guess Clayton is saying, what is the strategic way that we can get our apartments listed well, and then move on to the next? First of all, Clayton's my girl. How are <laughs> you? I sold her her apartment a long time ago and she is a very, she and her husband are very smart investors in real estate. And, you know, they have an asset that has matured so tremendously. And, you know, some people have different philosophies. Some people, my father was buy and hold, never would sell an asset. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, it's really about looking at your own vertical of what's important. I have people that are selling their assets that they've owned for a long time and they are renting for one year and they're buying smaller units for their children who are 13. They're going to buy an investment piece of property so that when they want to come back to go to college or live here afterwards, they have something that's going to be in their names. So that's, that's, that's a, a, an estate planning, a life planning. And that is something Clayton know, you, you know, I have a very strong opinion about that. You've had some incredible assets. So I think case by case and how to buy is going to be different from, for one person to another. And I will, and that's what I've been analyzing. I've done 46 analysis in 90 days and I'm listing probably 21 of those apartments. And some of them they're waiting. Some of them I'm renting. Some of them I'm trying to rent and or sell. What about neighborhoods, Louise? Any particular neighborhood going to be hotter than, than the next, you know, as we come out of this um, uh, pandemic? Um, lots of people want to sell for obvious reasons. We'll talk about that in a minute. But any particular neighborhood, again, going back to Clayton's question, that may be hotter than, than another? I mean, look, I think you can take a look. I just put a con I, I, I this week will have my fourth transaction that I'm putting together. So the market is heated up. I got a contract signed on a townhouse in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, you know, I'm doing deals. These these are deals that that transpired, you know, after COVID was peaked. 
and um, I facilitated principal to principal appointments and put a deal together and it was 11% off of pre COVID asking price. Um, Interesting. So that's Brooklyn and Brooklyn, by the way, has, you got to look at the last decade of its growth. It's like un, unbelievable growth, but I still think that they're great opportunities for pockets of, of maturity. I think that's going to happen. I think that, you know, the expectations of Hudson Yards and North Chelsea um, were, were hoping to be bolstered. I think, I think, listen, I think Hudson Yards got a long haul in front of them. So there might be some things opportunistic, but it's all relative, you know? I agree with you on Hudson Yards. It's predominantly uh, foreign investors who right now sort of are in their own lockdown. So they're not really investing here in the U.S. I leave they're coming. They'll be here. They'll be back for sure. Eileen Ball says, what is the outlook on the, uh, the rental markets, specifically Brooklyn and townhouses? I think townhouses, you know, uh, I, I heard Howard Lorbert and Pam Liebman talk about the whole COVID was going to be a, a driving factor for the townhouse market. Um, I'm not sure that's going to be the psychological motivation behind it. Um, but I do think that the townhouse market grew in the last 15 years tremendously. People took sort of cheap, gut renovated 1980s houses and put them back together for the last 20 years. And that market has been hit tremendously. I mean, I sold a townhouse that at the peak of the market, I was talking to my friends about selling it at 23 million and we sold it at 14 million in 2017. So I think that the rental market um, is going to be, I think it's going to be challenged. Um, I think that, you know, we have to find the right balance of, you know, sort of villainizing that I find that there, there are, are politics, the politics around landlords needs to chill out. And um, I think that the townhouse market is going to be opportunistic. And I think people are going to be able to rent townhouses in Brooklyn because there are going to be some people that are going to want to hold on to that asset for the next whatever that recovery time is, which I would probably nine out of 10 times advise them not to do that. Yeah, I wanted to chat a little bit about townhouses. So that question was uh, perfectly timed. I have been getting inquiries from people. And again, you know, based on our topic here, should, should you stay, should you go? Should you go really is going to a home with more space, with outdoor space. So my inclination would be to think that the townhouse market in New York City could potentially see a spike up in interest. And as you said, you know, through the years, it has exponentially risen in prices. I, the last one I sold was $17.5 million. You know, and when I repriced it again just recently for the seller, we were down to about 13, 14. He opted to hold. My thinking there, though, is that as we come out of this and people are trying to decide, should I go? Should I go to the Burbs? Should I go to Austin, Texas? Or shall I stay in New York City if I could afford to buy a townhouse or rent? At least it gives me the option of having more space that I would get in the Burbs and having that outdoor space that I would get in the burbs. So I think that maybe it could see a little bit of a spike up. I'm not saying that the whole townhouse market's going to become, you know, uh, what it was in 15 and 16 and 14, but you, you don't know. But Louise, talk, let's talk a little bit about the sales that you um, mentioned at the, uh, at the conclusion of the 9-11 tragedy, the 2008 and 9, how things spiked, you know, and how prices went up because people today are saying to me, and I'm sure to you, where will prices be when we get out of the pandemic, when we get back to work, when phase two really kicks in? Compare and contrast for us, if you can. Post well, I can, I, I can look at behavior. I mean, I, I feel that, that, you know, we experienced at the end of November, November, December, January, February, and even till March 18th, we had a frothy, healthy, strong market. Every contract I had, whether I was representing the seller or representing the buyer, there were multiple bids on them. Whether it was a million 395 
or 11 and a half million or 14 million. It did not matter. There were multiple bids. And that was because sellers stopped hoping for yesterday's prices and buyers had both confidence and felt that the adjustment that, that had happened in 18 and 19 and the patient pause that they had, it was ready because you had the support of the interest rates in, on top of it. Um, so if I look at 2020, uh, 2002, because I was thinking like, huh, is this going to be like September 11th or uh, after the Great Recession? I started just thinking about it in my head, which is why this topic came to me as I was talking to all my friends through this last 90 days of like, what should I do? And I remind them because some of them left after September 11th and they've been desperate to get back. And they are back. And those people have zero interest in leaving, just as an FYI. But the number of sales that were done in New York City, in Manhattan in 2002 was $10,300 with an average of $800,000. Um, in 2003, it was 23,000 transactions. Now the median only went up $50,000, which is about 10, you know, not even 10%, but that was a 200%, uh, like a, a hundred and whatever that, that it almost two and a half times the difference. And you had the same thing in 2007, there were, there were 21,000 transactions with a median price of 1.3. And in 2009, the lowest was 12,250 transactions. And by the way, 18 and 19 were exactly back where 2009 volume of sales were, exactly. So, that pause is what people, I believe, humbly, will be looking to being opportunistic because that is why the expectations for sellers, the expectations in all these development projects, there, there is going to be a oversupply of uber luxury. Think of all the deals north of $10 million. There's your opportunity. And there is where some of the European market's gonna come and some of the domestic market that's gonna be like, huh, okay, it's not 32 million today, it is 17. If I were to ask you, you know, your, your projection on timing, okay? Because everybody is so, you know, focused on timing. We gotta get out of phase one, which just started two days ago. We gotta get into phase two so we can get our life back together again. And though for those people who are considering leaving the city, <clears throat> In your opinion, what is the timing of all of this? Where do you think that we, based on everything we know today, and today can change tomorrow? But I, I, I'm pretty clear about that. I mean, and I'm, I'm using my own experience. My business is so diverse. I do $800,000 transactions to $20 million transactions. So I feel, and I, and I also represent a lot of development projects, so I, I, I feel very connected to a sort of bird's eye view of a market uh, because I operate in a lot of different niches. And I, I believe that we're going to have a natural pent up desire across every, I mean, I listed eight apartments in the last 12 days. One yeah. of those listings has had, you know, something like 4,200 clicks and saves. It is a $865,000 one bedroom at 49th and 1st in the building that I converted. And I believe that I'm going to have about 27 appointments on June 22nd because I'm booking them back to back and I'm booking them with mask and gloves and Purell in and Purell out. But I think we're going to have a huge, we're going to have our spring market July, August, I think September and October is going to be feeling out and whether we're back at school. And I think some people are going to be fearful that, that the weather and the flu season may be another wave of Corona, but I am really super bullish for, for finishing up the next six months of this year. Getting back to uh, should you stay or should you go schools, you just brought that up. Uh, very good point. Summer camps kind of on the fence right now. Are they opening? Are they not opening? Sleepaway camps, I heard, I think day, daycare, uh, day camps will be open, but sleepaway, no. 
We all know New York City uh, residents love their sleepaway camps. Getting back to schools in September, so getting into the mindset of our buyers and sellers, you know, will they, you know, leave the city and head to the burbs, wherever the burbs are of their choice, because of the school choice and because their kids just cannot deal with every day on the, you know, cement pavements of Manhattan? Is it going to be a, a, the impetus to leave really going to be about schools? I, I think that, you know, you, you know, look, when you go to Westchester, um, you have massive taxes, uh, but you have incredible education. Um, you know, I think that when you're looking for opportunistic places, when you're looking in very, very strong public school neighborhoods, forget it. You're, you're, it's going to be the last place. Think about it. I just put a deal together for something where they paid almost $160,000 more than the asking price. And her answer to me was, I was representing the seller, was it's three years of, of private school. Correct. And she's in a public school now. So she's, so it's, it's really how people acclimate to what, what's good and right for them. Um, I, I think that, that that is really where our jobs as, as their agents and their advisors, because I really don't think of myself as a salesperson by any means. I think about, um, you know, a, you know, my job is to create, to stimulate the questions, to help figure out what's right and wrong and what makes them tick. Because sometimes they don't even actually know what they're, they're thinking. And it's through asking the questions. And I, and I have a lot of my own life experience. Listen, my house is listed in Woodstock because I was so pounded down by people just offering me probably close to $175,000 more in Woodstock for my apartment, my house, than it would have been you know, three months ago, based on the brokers in my conversation, I'm listing it today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, again, that, those are the opportunities, you know, but on the flip side of all of this, you know, and, and we in the trenches always hear both sides of every story, of course, and especially as New Yorkers, but we're also seeing a lot, a, a new wave of a lot of people wanting to come into the city. So yes, you'll have those people who will do their exodus, but then there will also be that equal amount probably that will come into the city. And why? Because prices will be a little lower because opportunities may exist. And so here's an opportunity maybe to get into a new home or a new apartment in Manhattan or Brooklyn or Queens than ever before. Are you hearing- Listen, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting somebody today specifically with a plan. A plan, they sold their house in New Jersey. They want to rent. She is a tenured professor in Columbia. She um, and her husband is a, a serial investor and a Wall Streeter. She's very purposeful and very focused. Their goal is to, um, to rent for one year, then they wanna buy a townhouse and they wanna renovate it. And they want it to be above 110th Street. So, you know, that is, when somebody has that clarity for themselves, it's awesome for us. Yeah, I don't know if I lost you. Did I lose you? There you are. No, I'm here. Uh, no, I, I, I totally agree with that. You know, one of the things I was looking at, you know, in some of the research, and we all can relate to this as New Yorkers, you know, when you're standing on a crowded platform on the subway train or wherever you are, and you hear somebody say, oh, I'm just so over New York City. And then you'll meet up with that person, you know, later on, maybe for a cocktail after work or before dinner or whatever. And you ask them, you know, what did you really mean by that earlier today? And they're like, oh, you know, never mind. This is New York City. It's a great place. It's the only place on earth that you can do all of these things. And I think to sum all of that up, it basically, you know, translates to we are New Yorkers. We are not going to be pushed out like I was not going to be pushed out after 9-11. You know, we're, we're foot soldiers, we're feet on the street. This is our home and this is what we do. So we make do. And I think the real message here with should I stay or should I go is that's predetermined. And I think if you need to do that for family reasons, for school reasons, because you just happen to have come from the burbs and like the burbs and want to go back to the burbs, that's okay. I don't want to think that we can prepare this uh, as this is what will happen when pandemic ends because i really don't see any no and all. and to the listeners and and you know brokers and and advisors and 
you know, my bankers and my, you know, lead your people. You, you, I know my people and it's such a privilege to be such a part of their intimate lives yeah. when you become their advisors around their real estate because you help them make decisions about how they're going to live. Mm -hmm. And it's just to not be afraid to have a strong opinion and deliver the details, yeah. you know? Does anybody else have any uh, any other questions? I see something here. Um, thoughts on the drastic concern of small business owners plus the decline of department stores. Yeah, it's listen, the office, the office business, this is why we are going to have a long haul, but it is going to be, um, you know, what is, what's the last time we had a crisis with office buildings and, or, or, or we had a crisis downtown Alliance was developed and they passed tax incentives for converting buildings to residential. Yeah. Um, there, there's going to be a solution. Landlords are going to be nimble. They're going to make smaller space. They're, they're, they're going to be flexible. This is good. You know, survival of the fittest. That is how we, you know, through crises becomes opportunities. And somebody's, you know, the like, take a look at Zoom. Look, Zoom has got the right product at the right moment. He has tripled his net worth in three months. Oh my God, in, uh, amazing. Another comment here, uh, many of the financial concern offices rather stay, they aren't opening their New York offices until January of 21. A lot of uh, big corporate offices aren't interested in bringing people back. How then will that affect, you know? Listen, it is, it is, it is, it is the people and I feel like I am one of those privileged people that I am in that 1%. It is my responsibility to support my small business. I go out of my way to go to the little tiny Mexican restaurant outside of Amagansett to buy my dinner. I am going to be supporting the local businesses and that is what we can do. And that's, I mean, yes, I think that, that, that we are, we are, look, I think we need to fasten our seatbelts in a lot of different sectors of, of what we have in front of us. But as New Yorkers together, we are going to get through this. Yeah. And like I keep saying, going back to my personal experience of 9-11, you know, we're not going to let it just go, go to vote, so to speak. Everybody's going to have to sacrifice. Everybody's going to have to understand that we come back, we come back slow. We don't come back, you know, uh, full steam ahead because it's just not going to work that way. Restaurants will be back in a couple of weeks. And we'll start outside and then we'll migrate inside. Same thing with housing. Evelyn, we're all going to su su support each other to get to, to make New York strong again, because that's kind of what we do. Well, that's it. We're, we're um, any on other that note, I think we've got a whole series of these that we want to, that we want to do. We have other dates that we'll send out and um, we're going to really build on this and try to drill down in different sectors so that we can arm ourselves with the knowledge of power. And one of the other things we're going to do is we're going to bring in some suburban real estate agents to help us understand what and is navigate. happening, right, to help navigate. We have a great opportunity to partner. Correct. Absolutely. Any other questions before we say uh, goodbye? Because we've got a limited time here and we want to get everybody in if possible. Thanks, Eric. Love you. All right, sunshine. So thank you for your time today. We appreciate it and hope to see you next week, probably same Bye. time, same day. Bye, everybody.